Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, Tony Abbott's excuse for not visiting troops in Afghanistan. Should criminals get a lighter sentence if their parents dob them in? And Brazilian voters elect a real clown to their parliament. Our panel tonight, Chris Taylor from The Chaser, John Barron from ABC News Radio and Joe Stella from the Daily Grind website. First up tonight, the use of tasers is again being questioned after a number of violent confrontations involving police. In the latest incident overnight in Sydney's west, a man died after being tasered in the chest. The New South Wales Police Commissioner has defended his officers, saying they had no choice because the man was drunk and armed with two knives. The officers have done the right thing. There can be no denying that in my mind. Um, we'll wait for the coroner to determine the cause of death. But in terms of how the officers have acted, their um, use of the taser and certainly um, their compliance with procedures, they have been fully compliant and done exactly what was required of them. As I say, this was a life-threatening situation. It comes amid outrage over a taser incident in Western Australia involving an Aboriginal man. Two police officers tasered him 13 times at the East Perth Watch House. The attack in 2008 happened in front of other officers and was captured on CCTV. It was revealed in a report released by the state's Corruption and Crime Commission. The two officers received fines and still work as police. Now, John Barron, um, no one's defending the police actions today. The Premier's come out against it. The Attorney General's come out against it. Yeah, certainly in the West Australian case. And it's natural that these issues get bundled together. And there was the incident yesterday at the, uh, the St George Leagues Club as well, where it seems the man who died, in fact, wasn't tasered. He was capsicum sprayed and, and hit with a police baton. But it's important that we, we do separate them out and realise that it's uh, one thing to have uh, a man who apparently has two knives is severely intoxicated, is threatening sexual assault on, on the person who's, who's made the phone call to police and is apparently endangering the lives of police compared with the Perth case two years ago where it was in a police station. There were nine other police officers standing by. It was a mentally ill man who was tasered 13 times. They are very, very different situations. I think it's important that we don't, we don't blur the two in looking at a legitimate argument about when tasers should be used and how much force is appropriate in different situations. And, Chris, in the WA case, it doesn't seem like they're, they're, they were doing anything for any purpose that the tasers were initially introduced for, which was to stop those kind of ugly incidents where someone in the public might have a weapon and may be threatening police or the public. Well, based on the, the CCTV um, that we just saw, it, it doesn't seem to be any argument or any defence that the police officers' lives are in jeopardy or under threat. It, it, I think the WA incident is pretty much unpardonable mm. and uh, indefensible. Um, I, I must admit I'm uneasy about tasers generally. I think um, I, I don't know enough about the technology in itself, so I couldn't, I couldn't speak authoritatively on it. But anything that's killing members of the public, as we've just seen in New South Wales once and possibly twice, um, I think is a problem. Um, now we can talk about better training, uh, instructing officers how to use them better or more appropriately. I understand there are measures in place to make sure you only shoot them from certain distances and also up to certain areas of the body. I think one of the New South Wales men was hit in the chest, mm. which is a, a red flag to potential heart attack and this kind of thing. I am uncomfortable with the, the idea of police abusing what is clearly a lethal device. I mean, obviously it's a step up from guns. Gun, we had all sorts of problems with guns in Victoria, but Tasers are killing people too, and we either need better training or just need new techniques to try and, uh, you know, modify or ameliorate threatening people. I mean, maybe you just send Rob Oakshot out to talk to people at length. Just have... or have What's that new Melbourne talk radio station? Just have that on loop. That'll calm people down very quickly, won't it? <laughs> Joe, what's your response to the WA case? <sighs> Unfortunately, police are always going to find themselves in cases, and obviously... West Australian case is not one of these where their lives, the lives of the people they're trying to subdue or the lives of bystanders are at risk and any technology that you use to forcibly subdue someone carries the risk of death, whether it's a, a humble baton or the handguns that the tasers are meant to replace. So the fact that they are lethal devices needs to be noted, but it isn't a reason to rule out the use of tasers altogether and I think the CCC reports recommendations in terms of uh, automatic uh, review of any uh, cases of, of tasering you know, in a custodial situation like we saw at the Perth Watch House uh, against vulnerable groups, whether it be pregnant women, uh, Indigenous people, uh, that I think can go a long way towards uh, making the public feel more comfortable. Were you surprised, about Joe, that uh, there was no charges laid over those? That, I was that disgusted. Attack? I mean, I saw that footage this morning and it has no place in a free country. I mean, they said 
uh, you know, th these are shocking images, you know, viewer discretion advised. And I think I'm pretty cynical and jaded. I can, I can take whatever the news serves up. I, I was affected by that, um, all the more so because it was happening here in Australia. It was almost, I sort of had flashbacks to Rodney King. It was like it was a gang mm. of police beating up on a defenceless yeah. uh, man. Incarceration, I think? Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. yeah but, but we should also remember that, that image, the, uh, the, the still newspaper image from the late 1990s where Ronnie Levi was on Bondi Beach surrounded by police officers. He was carrying a knife. He was only threatening to harm himself and he was shot and he was killed in that situation. Uh, I think Joe makes an important point that the taser has to be seen as a lethal weapon. The, the, the designers refer to it as a less lethal alternative to the service revolver. But it has to be seen in that context and it has to be used in that context as an alternative to shooting somebody dead. They're, they've been deployed a couple of million times, tasers, around the world. There have been a couple of hundred deaths associated with it. Less than 50 that have been... Coroners have said, yes, that is the reason why this person had a heart attack and died. So we need to say these are not to be used as you would use a baton or a capsicum spray. This is to be used instead of shooting the person dead. There is still a chance they could end up dead, and that's a tragedy. And, John, that but seems to, to be what's lives. happened in New South Wales' case, if, if, if we're to believe what the police have said today. Yeah. And, the, and the Commissioner, Andrew Scipioni, has said that in the instance that, where a man died overnight, that he had two knives with him, that yep. he was believed to be drunk, and that he was within two to three metres of the police. Now, this is one of those classic situations where it would seem that taser use would be justified. Of, of course, and, and yet we also have to bear in mind in a huge number of these cases where, where people are shot and killed by police, they're behaving irrationally, often because they're mentally ill, or if they're not mentally ill, it's because they're undergoing a, a, a psychotic episode because of methamphetamine use in so many cases. Police, as well as looking at how they, they deploy tasers, should also be looking at how they deal with people in those situations so it doesn't escalate to the point where they can say, well... He's coming at us with a knife now. We can shoot him, whether it's with a gun or with a taser. Is there is there anything though in between capsicum spray and a taser? Because like, well, like when, when you call a, a taser a less lethal alternative, it sounds yep. to me like Orwell sort of news speakers. Yep. It's still a lethal weapon. It's killed. Yes. It's yep. killed several times. Yep. Um, but so what, is capsicum spray. People so have had times. asthma attacks from they have, capsicum what, spray. What are what other tools are being tried. The extended baton is another thing that was a key recommendation after another case about six years ago in New South Wales was the idea that you want to have a device that you can subdue somebody by breaking their kneecaps essentially but from a safe distance so that they can't get at you with a knife if they're coming at you. So that is another alternative. It was a, an alternative that was deployed on, uh, on Sunday night at the St George Leagues Club as was capsicum mm. spray. The guy ended up dead all the same. It's not an easy issue because obviously the protection of our police is paramount and yet I do feel like there's a sort of little civil libertarian inside of me that gets really angry every time I see a citizen often a, a mentally unwell citizen killed because of these instruments that the police are carrying and all I can suggest I'm not pretending the situation was easy the other night but there does seem to be an issue with training and the correct use of well, the what New, is a lethal weapon. The New South Wales Ombudsman came out today and said that the vast majority of officers use uh, tasers appropriately and it was interesting to see to the WA Corruption and Crime Commission report found uh, percent, potential misuse was only involved in 7% of cases between 2007 and 2009. So it does seem that the misuse is uh, less likely to happen. Well, the good thing is that a lot of tasers, and this, this should be a general thing, uh, are fitted with cameras, which means that um, people who are impartial observers can then review the actions of police. Some you in can't in do three it. states, it seems That's right, and this yeah. is something that should be rolled out further. Um, but that's something you don't have with handguns or batons, where the police can say, oh, he had a knife. Well, we'll take, we'll take up this issue with uh, barrister and author Greg Barnes, who's going to join us at 6.30, who's written a pretty provocative piece on the Drum website. That's uh, coming up soon. Well, Tony Abbott continues to cop flack over his decision to forego Julia Gillard's invitation to visit Australian troops in Afghanistan. The opposition leader claimed he was worried about being too tired for the Tory party conference in Birmingham. And he's meeting with British PM David Cameron. I thought it was important uh, to do this trip justice and uh, I didn't want to get here uh, in an entirely jet-lagged condition and uh, so uh, uh, I'm in a position to uh, make the most of this opportunity. Chris Taylor, do you find it hard to believe a man who can uh, do the Port Macquarie uh, marathon <laughs> yeah. triathlon mm. in 14 hours would be suffering no, from no, jet-lag? No, 
Tony's not good sitting down in play. He would have been fine <laughs> if he could swim to Afghanistan because then his body would be fit, he'd be in good nick. But, you know, the, the other thing you've got to remember is David Cameron's a very boring man. <laughs> you want to be on your game. If you're sitting down to talk to David Cameron, you want to be very well rested rather than risk. So you want to dominate the conversation, is that what you're suggesting? You absolutely do, but... Um, Look, I don't. I can't get too concerned about this. I mean, I think that the politics of this probably is um, that the coalition may be sort of retooling its position on Afghanistan and uh, didn't want the pictures of Tony there in case they're going to do a bit of a U-turn. But I, you know, as, as I understand these visits to Afghanistan, they're largely sort of token picture opportunities, and they're always said it's it's good for the morale of the troops. Now, I can't think of anything that would be better for troop morale than having Tony Abbott stay well away. Like, <laughs> troop morale would have plummeted if Tony Abbott suddenly popped up, wouldn't it? Joe Stella, response from you there? Well, I think it's actually the, the opposite. Is Julia Gillard is the one who's in need of, of credibility when it comes to the Afghan war. She's just allied herself with a group in Parliament that's implacably opposed to that, um, and she's the one who's in search of a policy. The Coalition do, do have a policy, that's more troops... Um, more, more support for those troops in Afghanistan. Is there any division among their policy there? Because uh, the front bench of David Johnson came out and said that, but Tony Abbott seemed to be a little bit behind uh, his defence spokesperson on that. I think that um, the Liberals are never going to have a problem with a, a credibility gap on issues of, of national defence. It's one of their core issues, just like health is for Labor. And I think for him to be there uh, next to the Prime Minister would only have uh, lent some of his gravitas on this issue to the Prime Minister. That's something he didn't need to do. As uh, Chris points out, it is you know, a, a political stunt, a political piece of theatre, the whole going to Afghanistan thing. So sure. for him to avoid it, I think, was fair enough. I think the politics of this is, is interesting. The, you allude to the fact that David Johnson was, was out last week. And that was interesting because there's usually a bipartisan approach mm. in, to, to defence policy. And for him to be saying, well, we need more troops, we need more, more mortars, we maybe need, as uh, Jim Molden, the former commander in Iraq, says, we maybe need to send some tanks over as well. I think in light of that, I don't know, but I suspect that that wasn't well coordinated with the prospect of Tony Abbott going to Afghanistan. There's every chance that David Johnston didn't know, because this was a secret visit or at least mm. an unannounced visit, didn't know that Tony Abbott was maybe going to be stopping over. It would have looked bad if Tony Abbott had gotten to Afghanistan after what was said publicly. And I suspect the hesitance that you talked about, where Tony Abbott was kind of just, you know, not endorsing David Johnston last week 100%, was probably because they'd had a call from the Prime Minister's office saying, well, we're stopping over in Afghanistan, you're coming too. And he suddenly thought, oh... That could look a little bit awkward. And, John, there's some suggestion, too, that perhaps the whole jet lag excuse is a bit mm. of a smokescreen, that perhaps yeah. he has organised to go there, um, but he just doesn't want to come out and say when he's going and, and, and what time he's going to be there. If, if he's not planning a, a trip, a stopover on the way back,